I think I have to start with an apology. Sorry, the next 10 minutes will be about DRM, our favorite topic of all time. Um, I'm trying to make that somewhat interesting. Um, so the reason why, why I submitted this talk and why I wanted to have this opportunity to, um, to talk about it is that DRM, especially in browsers, but pretty much on, on all of the devices, let's say for the nature of the beast is kind of a black box. And for engineers working with video systems that deploy DRM, um, it can be very helpful to actually understand at least to some degree and where possible what's happening under the hood. This is something that at least in, in the browser space um, is possible because we have a, a proper specification for it, right? So the DRM system in the browser goes through encrypted media extensions and this is properly specced so you can look up some things. But as you'll see in a few, uh, few slides down, uh, there's still quite a bit of, let's say, proprietary stuff that depends on the DRM system that you're using uh, and the environment and what you're trying to do. So there's still a lot of things that are specific to the system that, uh, that you're using. Um, the reason why I think it could be interesting to dive a little bit into this is that usually debugging any kind of DRM related issues is insert your favorite square word here. Um, but at the same time, it's a critical component on your playback path because if it doesn't work, you will have no playback. I mean, that's the whole point of a DRM system to a certain extent. So what we need to do in order to avoid the greenish kind of gibberish uh, that can come not only when you try to reverse video, but also when you have the wrong key, um, is in the browser, you start with a video element. In most of the cases, you'll continue with media source buffers to push your content, but of course there are environments, like in Safari, for instance, you can just use a tier one player, just leverage the source element of, uh, of video, push some content and sort of follow along without media source buffers. They are not essential uh, in, that, in that sense. The next component that we're going to look at is uh, media key system access, which basically provides access to the system uh, and allows you to create a media keys instance. And this is the CDM, the content decryption module, the main sort of proprietary implementation of the DRM system. And then once we have that, we attach a bunch of listeners. Um, once we have the listeners in place, we do something and create media sessions, attach a bunch of more listeners, and we're basically good to go. So, Let's start by looking at um, how to actually navigate EME. And of course, we start with the navigator. Um, from the navigator, we can actually get um, access to the media key system access. So this is sort of the first um, touch point that you have with the DRM system. And here's also where the not so well specified part begins because it literally begins in the first parameter. The first parameter is basically expressing your desire for a specific key system. Um, in the slides here and in, in the examples and in this talk, I'm focusing on white wine, but this of course um, applies to uh, Apple's Fairplay system or Microsoft's Play Ready. Um, it's just that you would have to give it a different identifier um, to, to tell the system what kind of CDM you would like to initialize. Um, following along that, um, you, you provide um, the init data types. This is an array, so you can put more in there and you might might be lucky and get more support um, or can express more things. The most common one is common encryption. This is what you usually do for uh, fragmented MP4 and Dash or, um, or HLS. Um, but there are other init types because it depends on the key system. So for instance, in case of uh, Fairplay, you put um, SKD or SINF uh, since it depends on if you use the, the fragmented MP4 with EMI and your own player or AV player and and push um, SKD in a data. So you see it gets already a bit tricky because you need to know a lot of pieces of the underlying systems that you're using. Next thing that you do is uh, you specify the capabilities that you desire, which means that basically you tell the system what to expect. So in this case, um, telling it that I have an AVC1 track uh, video MP4, um, and then I do the same thing for audio in order to sort of tell the access system what to expect uh, in terms of content. Um, so that it can give me back a CDM that can actually support this. And then I have a bunch of uh, other properties that I can set that are basically around the actual um, CDM session type, if you will. So this allows you to um, have distinctive identifiers if you so dare, maybe not. Um, or maybe more interestingly, uh, use a persistent state and persistent licenses, which basically allows you to pre-cache your, your DRM licenses um, and then have potentially faster startup times. So once you have all of this in place, you basically call access.create media keys, um, apply it to the video element, and uh, you're, you're done. 
So at this point, uh, you, you, you might run into some gotchas. Uh, the most common one that I see if I, you know, um, browse around the web and see what different sort of OTT streaming services do with their DRM systems, in a lot of cases, well, predominantly with Widevine, uh, I basically see two license requests, two requests to the DRM server where there should only be one. And the most common reason for this is that somebody forgot to set the server certificate. So Widewine needs a server certificate. Fairplay also needs a server certificate. The benefit there is it crashes if you don't give it to it. So it's very obvious that something is wrong. In the Widewine case, it's less obvious because it basically goes twice through the license request flow first time requesting a certificate, and then next time doing the actual license request. So this is obvious, obviously overhead um, that is very, very easy to, to avoid, because all you need to do is call um, on, on your media key system, uh, set server certificate, and give it the bytes of the certificate, which you can fetch. And your DRM service provider is probably happy to tell you a URL where you can fetch it from. These certificates typically don't change. You should be prepared for that, though, because they might. But usually they are not, and usually they're also very small. So I've also seen cases where they're just embedded in the application. And you, can, they, you get usually a, um, a predefined error if you have the wrong certificate. So this is, you, this is potentially a good way to sort of go back and refetch a new version of the certificate if it ever happens that it, that it changes. Um, the next um, gotcha that you have there is um, security levels. So security levels basically tell the CDM what kind of se security you expect. Uh, what this means is that in terms of the implementation of the DRM system, there are different ways to do this. The, let's say the, the naive, in quotes, approach would be you just implement it in software. Um, so everything is exposed in your RAM. So if I take a snapshot, theoretically, I could just find the key because it sits there somewhere, and then there are different sort of additional layers that you can structure around this, all the way down to implementing the entire DRM system with the decryption module, the CDM, and the decoder into a secure hardware module so that you hide it away from, from anybody else as much as you can. But this is something that you need to explicitly express when you create your key system. So this doesn't come out of the box. Um, you do this in, in EMI by basically listing the capabilities and saying, hey, I would like to have like hardware security and also hardware security and decoder and maybe hardware secure crypto module. They are different levels. You usually get uh, not, not all of them, but you might. Um, and they're levels um, from like most secure to least secure, but again, they are proprietary. So the settings here um, are specific to Widewine. If this would be play ready, uh, you would say something like SL3000, SL2000, SL150. Um, it's a little bit unfortunate because the EMI spec actually lists five security levels, so they're, it's not necessary that, that they are um, proprietary, but at this point uh, they are. So you need to keep an eye out for this. The reason why this is very important is that you might have constraints on where your keys are allowed to be used. So for instance, you might have, let's say, ultra HD renditions where you require a level one hardware secure uh, DRM playback, and so you need to explicitly request that. At the same time, you might have scenarios where you have, for instance, multiple playbacks running at the same time, um, and your hardware might just not be able to provide secure decodes for both of them. If it's implemented in hardware, there might just be one hardware instance of that decoder that is in this secure environment. So you might want to explicitly request a CDM that is not a hardware secure backed CDM so that you can spawn a second player. Um, so this is just something to, to keep out for. Similarly for uh, the codex. So um, the codex is something you get from your manifest. Um, usually you don't run into issues with this, but if you can be precise, just be precise and you get a sort of better overview as possible. From there, you basically go into checking your configuration. So once you have your access, get the configuration and check what you got. You should probably not bail out with just an error, um, but handle this more gracefully and decide maybe not to play certain renditions. So what happens then in terms of license flow is basically you append some data to your video element, you get an encrypted event, uh, you create your session, um, generate your license request, handle some messages, um, feed the license back through an update, and you're good to go. So how does this look in code? Um, it's basically like this. As I said, you listen to the encrypted event. Um, then there, you create a new session, attach a message listener, um, and then there, you fetch your license, call session.update with the response, and uh, you're done. 
A very important listener that uh, gets forgotten uh, in a lot of cases is key status update uh, or key status change. This informs you about the status of the keys in your CDM and can be tremendously helpful to understand what's actually loaded and what's the state of those uh, keys. So what you need to look out for here is that uh, according to spec, um, the encrypted element gets basically triggered every time DRM initialization data is encountered when you push stuff into your buffers. And it's not only that the DRM init data that you get there is specific to your DRM system, you get all the DRM init data that, uh, that the buffer basically found when you pushed your init segment or your segment. So you need to be a little bit careful when it comes to um, triggering license requests because you might have the key already. So a typical scenario here is you push video init segment, you push audio init segment, they use the same key, um, but that you will get two encrypted events. Um, so you only need to handle one of them because filling that key into the session is good enough for both, basically. So how this looks in code is basically on your encrypted event, you need some sort of check that says, hey, do I really need to have a session for this? Um, there are a couple of things to look out for. Key rotation is one of them. Um, you loaded something already as something else. Safari is a special case. Their encrypted events are a little bit, they're like divas. They don't like to be rejected. So just send them downstream and everything will be good. Um, so this is something to just look out for when it comes to um, encryption events. The other thing that is a lot of fun is key rotation. So this is um, coming up more and more, especially for live streams, where you basically, during your event, change your keys. So the issue here is that um, in the white wine case, actually by spec, um, the expectation of, uh, of, um, of the system is that you get more than one key. You get the key that you requested, so segment N gets key N, but you also get N minus one and N plus one. So if you, in your checks, do I need to do a license request, check, hey, do I have this key already? You might hear yes, but it's actually not enough because you are doing key rotation. So even though you have the key, you still wanna do the request to make sure that you get the next triplet and gain a little bit of time when it comes to your uh, DRM requests and play nice with the DRM server basically at this point. And last but not least, as I said at, the, at some point in between, key status updates are crucial. So it can very easily be happen, uh, happen that, you, that keys are rejected by the DRM service, so you don't get what you expect, but it can also happen that you have dynamic environments and that the typical sort of, my, my pet peeve is HTCP over HDMI. So you have an HDMI cable, it creates an encrypted channel between your display and your, uh, and your client, and your kids just trip over the table, uh, cable and it rips out. And now you lost your HTCP connection and your key is not usable anymore. So your player needs to be able to handle this because uh, you just need to wait, uh, switch rendition down to something that's playable or pause, and then wait until your kid plugs the, the cable back in. And with that said, thank you everybody for listening to this interesting DRM talk. Uh, thanks for the, to the DMUX crew, Phil and Matt and everybody else involved for having me. And thanks to my employer, Cast Labs, for um, allowing me to be here and actually pay for the trip. Thank you. Yeah.